Hello and welcome to Contractor Success Tips. Today's guest is Michael Linehan of Aurora Builders. Well, hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Contractor Success Tips. I'm your host, Ed Earl, the Zen Builder, and I'm here with my colleague from Residential Contractor Services Group, Paul Sanneman. And today we are excited to have joining us on the show, Michael Lenahan from Aurora Builders. Michael, thank you for being here. My pleasure. <clears throat> so Michael is coming to us from St. Petersburg, Florida. And Michael, why don't we start off by having you give us a little background, both on yourself as well as your company, Aurora Builders. Absolutely. I'm going to pull you into another time zone, St. Peter's, Western Florida. I'm out of the Jacksonville market in Northeast Florida in the Eastern time zone. So just a little tweak there. So uh, we are a luxury custom home builder out of Jacksonville, Florida. My company is 23 years old and we uh, desire to build the upper end uh, of of the housing market. Our clients are those who own their own piece of property, and they are looking to have uh, an architect and a builder engage in creating their dream home. Uh, most of my clients, uh, the way I've built my niche is that they're you know, more affluent, uh, successful in business, and probably in that 55 and up range. So they're looking to build their dream home, and they're looking to form the team, the architect, interior designer, and builder who can help them realize that dream. And how about, Michael, a little background on, on yourself and your, 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 your background's a little different than I think most of the, the traditional contractors that we, we work with. I would agree with that, Ed. Most of the contractors that I know grew up in the building business, either their family was in the business or they've always been carpenters and whatnot. Uh, Mine is a little bit different. Um, I pursued a degree in architecture, actually have two degrees in architecture, because while I wanted to be involved in residential construction, I wanted to know how homes were designed the way they were and why they were designed the way they were. I wanted to not necessarily be in the trade as much as I wanted to be in the management, to work on a site, to understand and help instruct others on how to build homes. And that's that was my motivation. And taking my uh, architecture training allowed me to understand the why, the why a home works or doesn't work, and how that home can satisfy so many needs the owner has, not just for dwelling, but for comfort and safety and um, and, and quality of life. So uh, right out of college, I went to work for a national home builder. At the time, they were the number three builder in volume in the country. We built track homes, <laughs> just 20 down one side of the street, 20 up the other side of the street. Run and gun, um, a great experience because I learned the art of scheduling. Having to build a single family home in 63 days was a challenge. And the art of cost control, where we couldn't vary more than 2% because the margins were so tight on track homes. And from there, I actually was uh, transferred down to Jacksonville, Florida, from where I had been in the suburbs of Maryland. And um, I opened a new division of that company down here in Jacksonville. So as my career advanced, I then went from track homes to semi-custom, from semi-custom to custom, and then from custom to what I call luxury custom homes, where we assist in the design process for the building of the home. We don't just wait and and, and have four or five model styles and and, and look for making a few changes. To me, I want to cater to those people who truly want a home designed around their family and their lifestyle. So how do you get most of your business, Michael? Interestingly enough, uh, a lot of it does come from word of mouth because I am in a niche. Uh, We are low volume by intent. Uh, We only want to build three to four luxury custom homes a year. We also do remodeling, but um, it is is our satisfied clients and our industry associates, architects, interior designers, real estate agents, those three I call it the food chain. Those three touch the client before I do. I am the fourth in line in that food chain. You know, no one buys a piece of land that's just going to let weeds grow. No one goes to an architect and then just stares at the plan. So everybody needs to have a trusted partner that they can refer their, um, refer whether they need an interior designer, a pool builder, and, or, or a contractor like myself. So 
Um, we have built a number of strong alliances over the years, and uh, they pay off with um, a solid referral business. Now, how do you initiate and maintain those relationships? I think it has to go both ways. Um, we bring clients to architects. We introduce clients to interior designers, just as they will in turn come back to us. And real estate agents, you know, if those who believe that it's more than just the one transaction understand that they can look better and to be a more valued resource to their client who just bought a home that needs to be remodeled or a piece of land, they can be a more of a resource if they say, okay, how else can I help you? You're coming from New Jersey, from Connecticut. Yes, I know a builder. Yes, I know a veterinarian, a dentist. So I will call on realtors and ask, how can I help you? How can I be a trusted resource that when you give my name to a client, I will take care of that client so, for you? That brings a good point, Michael. How do you initiate that call? I mean, let's say there's a realtor who's one of the key realtors in your market and you don't know that person. How do you initiate that relationship and maintain it? Well, I research them and I, I find that they are one of the leading realtors. And I simply ask the question, do you feel comfortable recommending a building contractor or remodeler? And if not, why? And I find that many of them are not comfortable because they're extending the risk on their reputation. What if it doesn't work out? So I asked them if I could have maybe some time, a cup of coffee, as I did yesterday morning with a brand new realtor. And I asked if there's some way that I could be that resource to, to give them some comfort that I'm the one with some answers while they're, is this lot buildable? What would it cost to you know build on the ocean versus across the street from the ocean? Can I put a second floor on a one-story home? And rather than it being a, a, a palms up type answer, I, you know, I really can't help you. Let's go look for another piece of property. Let's go look for another home. They can call me and I can meet them out there and just be someone who can provide knowledge and answers at no cost, no obligation. If I ask how I can help them, they will in turn say, you know something, that's someone I want to come back to. Now, a lot of realtors are afraid that the builder is going to mess up the deal. <clears throat> For example, they have this lot that maybe has a couple issues with, I don't know, might be soil issues or whatever. And my experience is realtors are in business to sell stuff. That's why they're realtors. And sometimes they'll bring in a builder, whether it's remodeling a home, they go, this is like, I wouldn't do it or whatever. And a lot of realtors are afraid that the builder is going to kill the deal. Um, so how do you overcome that fear? I, you can't. You either, some realtors are not going to ever be comfortable recommending even a plumber or a tree trimmer. It could backfire, and they're just not going to do that. But others are going to have already heard of me as I've heard of them. We're in a, uh, a, only a couple of small communities here on northeast Florida's coast, and they see your signs. They see your homes. They've known your reputation maybe through another one of the realtor associates. So that comfort level is through their research and even allowing me to have an audience with them. Okay. And then well, what did, I'm going to play role play a little bit. So I'm going, well, Michael, that sounds good. But what if I bring you on a piece of land and building's going to be difficult because of foundation issues? Or I guess the question is, how can you help me sell the deal as opposed to throw cold water on it? That's a good question, particularly out here on in our area where there's oceanfront construction. The homes need to be on deep pilings directly across the street. They don't need pilings. So there's a big delta in the cost to build that home. We're going way up high on a dune, 28 feet above sea level on a dune, whereas across the street, it's at street level. So there are, there are additional costs for building, impact-resistant glass in the windows, um, better materials used on the outside that are going to resist the, the, the elements. So how do I provide that information without scaring the client into, oh my gosh, I can't afford that. Let's look right. elsewhere. Right. It is the sensitivity of saying, now, of course, you know, on the ocean, you'll probably want to do this to protect your investment. You'll want to have these features there. And it will cost more, but the view when you get to that height, as you ascend that driveway with double retaining walls to get you way up on top of it, the reward when you get there. So if this lot's for you, it's going to come with these challenges, which we are experienced in helping you with. Okay. So you help the realtor close the deal by selling the 
for lack of a better, the emotional impact of the property versus the cost of making it work. Always go to the emotional. It's always about the why. And I ask them, why are you buying this property? Well, for the view, well, for the direct access to the beach, whatever that is, I always will cater my answers to return back to the why, because okay. that is always going to be the emotional reason for a purchase. So realtors can see you as a person who helps make the deal happen as opposed to kill it. I believe they see the integrity of my answers as being uh, helpful and supportive of the transaction. Great. So I like to bring another subject up. Um, you're a unique person in the fact that you have an architectural background, even a master in architecture, and are a builder. Now, having done this for 30 years, we've dealt with the sort of, for lack of a better term, adversary relationship between a builder and a contractor. In general, the, the, I mean, architect. In general, the architect is afraid that the builder is going to mess up their design or not understand it, or somehow not get built what needs built. And the a contract, on the other hand, is afraid that the architect is going to over-design and the, con and the uh, client won't be able to afford it and look for another architect and another builder bring down the cost. So you are a person of, 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 among very few that's on both sides of that. So how do you handle, how do you go from like the conflict situation to a collaborative situation? There are certainly a few architects that would rather not have that extra seat occupied at the design table. They want to design for one client, not their mother-in-law, not their builder, the interior designer, absolutely not. They want to control the situation, and I understand that, and I respect that. Uh, those also happen to be the same architects that once that home is designed, there's maybe two, possibly three builders that they're going to have been on that plan every time. Their door's not open for challenge or looking at any other new builders. So let that world take its, take its place the way it wants to be. But for the majority of the market, the, the other residential designers and architects, when they allow the builder to sit at the table and experience the, the, the benefit the builder brings to their design, they now welcome me at the table. And it, 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 took, it took an initiation period for sure. There's two things I will never do. I will never redesign on top of the paper and give it back to the architect. There's only one designer. And I will always ask if I am being consistent with their design intent when I suggest something to the client. The relationships I have with the local architects are outstanding because they have found that I can be a significant resource to them. No architect wants to design a home only to see the plans rolled up and put on a shelf because it went out to bid and the lowest bid was 200000 over cost. They don't want that. They want to see their monument, their testimony to their design excellence. If I can be in, involved in the process early on, I the value I bring is we start with the budget, which is not typical in a design scenario. I, I, I hate to say it, but a lot of <clears throat> architects are not in tune with the current cost per square foot to build. So while they may be designing for that $200 a foot, and I'm clearly at $300 a foot, I'm going to be the one to give the bad news if I first come onto the scene when the ink is dry on the plans. I would rather say, I hear what you're saying with the budget. I hear what you're saying with the kinds of materials you want. Let's make sure we're designing whatever you want, but let's do it within your budget, materials and installation techniques within the budget. And when the architect sees that I'm there for that purpose, they know that plan's going to be built and not just rolled up on a shelf. So let's say to be specific here, how do you mean, let's say the, the client comes in with a, you know, a 40 foot window kind of thing that opens, it's going to cost a you know, hundred thousand dollars, hugely expensive. And they fall in love with it. And the architect says, Oh, that's really cool. I mean, I, that when you look at the whole ocean that way, it'll be amazing, but it's going to blow the budget by like $50,000. How do you, you know, sort of rein the architect in without upsetting people? I think we go back again to the design intent. Everybody wants an unobstructed view. But you know something, when you have that wall of glass and I'm looking here out the window at a hurricane zone, 130 mile per hour zone that we must design in, if it's all glass, there's very little resistance that 130 mile per hour. So there needs to be shear walls at the opposite direction to hold. So now I'm putting steel, I'm wrapping 
you know, steel columns and steel beams over that all glass opening. And we're, we're doubling down on the cost. The bottom line is the home's not going to get built. So we can design something that can't be built. We're going to pull our resources and say, well, how can we do this? And I might just suggest something like, you know, something I really like how these doors fold, you know, six panels all collapse and you have a big opening. In reality, though, are you going to let your air conditioning in Florida just right outside? Are you really going to let that hot air come in into your home? Are you really going to let that warm, moist air permeate all of your finishes inside? It's unlikely you're going to leave that door open in our climate. So how can we design enough of a glass opening to see the view, but not to blow the budget and have an unrealistic solution? Great. So I imagine those kind of things come up when you are the sort of like voice of reason when it comes to holding to the budget in the design process, right? I very, um, se- I'm very sensitive on how I bring that up, but I will not hesitate to hold, hold my hand up in the air and say, just before we go a little further, I believe that a home can be better designed if the team is at the table. The client who knows what they would like the architect who has the creativity and the builder who can lend that logistical support. And if everyone stays in their lane and respects each other's talents and and input, we together are going to make sure this gets built. My philosophy is let's start with your budget. If you say your budget is a million dollars and you want 5,000 square feet, there's no sense picking up the pencil and starting to draw. So we're going to try and say, can we go over the million or can we come under 5,000 square feet? How can we design a home so efficiently that we don't have any wasted space? So from that standpoint, they understand that we're all in it for the same purpose is to go vertical and have a three-dimensional house, not a two-dimensional set of plans. Okay. So um, I also think I, I was going to just clarify too, Michael, I, I would assume with that kind of a philosophy, um, the architects are going to want to work with you. And so do you, you find you get a lot of repeat business from end up working with a lot of the same contractors or architects over and over again? I absolutely do, Ed, because they may never admit it, but they know that I am someone who makes them look better because they're developing a solution that worked in a budget. And had I not been at the table or any contractor at the table, they would have designed something that just didn't fit the budget. And, and you know, the architects, the, the owner's going to pay, I don't know, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 for the plan or more and go, I just got three bids. I can't afford this. And I hate to say this, but the architect never loses because now you're going to pay him again to redesign it smaller. I've never seen right. an architect lose. And, and I have great admiration for architects, but they design... You said you had a million dollar budget, but then you said, I want this, 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 and this. And it's the owner's fault that the house got that big, not the architects. Right. So right. I believe we should re- respect both budget and design needs and wants and see how we can work together to get this thing done. One question. As a builder, can you help builders understand the architect's point of view? Because a lot of builders just flat don't like architects like you know they go they always you know they over design and there's a prejudice for lack of a better term of builders against architects you know what i mean a lot of builders just don't they say look at they always over design they always it, it, they never keep the budget in mind can you help our builders understand maybe the architect's point of view since you've been on both sides i think you have to understand that uh architects more than most other uh, professions have a lot of pride just like an artist or a sculptor, it is their creativity. Don't don't mock my baby, you know. So mm-hmm. so taking anything away, taking the extraordinary detail away from the home has ruined the home in their mind. Whereas in our case, we've saved money. We got the owner to move in. An architect is qualified to design an architectural style. And if the owner says, "I want Mediterranean," your architect's going to say, "Okay." That's a big body of water. Are we talking Spanish, French, Italian? Are we talking Northern Italian, Southern Italian? Okay, so we're talking, you want a Tuscan home is what you wanted. Well, that Tuscan design should look the same in the front door, right out the back door. And if you commission an architect to deliver a Tuscan home, don't be telling them where you want crown molding. Don't be telling them where you want this. The architect knows what a Tuscan home looks like. So for those clients, you really have to back off and say, 
let that architect have full reign. But if the client sort of shows a picture, I like this style, they're not asking you to go full-blown Tuscan. They sort of want that tower look and a minimalist detail and that old world appearance. But then they also want to be able to live in the home. So I think you have to understand if it's not a hard, rigid architectural style, those architects are basically there to design a home for the owner. When it's an architectural style, okay, you show me the picture, I'll get back to you. And the architect's going to go all the way through and design it including the, the the door handles. The door handles have to look Tuscan. The light fixtures have to look Tuscan. They're designing a monument for you to live in. I happen to gravitate to the architects that design a home that the owner asked for. And right. I think that's the majority of the architects. But I, what I hear you saying is the builder may not understand the architect's ego investment in the design. Right. Because they, architects didn't become architects to make money, obviously because there's not much money in architecture compared to builders. And I've also noticed that there's a, a little bit of an ongoing prejudice because in general, a, su a successful architect makes more than a su more successful builder makes more than a successful architect and doesn't have the education, doesn't have the uh, liability and whatever. There's some sort of like, it's not fair, <laughs> right? How, how he yeah. makes most how of the money and I, and I take most yeah. of the risk and, and stuff. Well, look, builders are tired of decades and decades of being the bearer of the bad news. We're the ones that put the bid together. We give it, and the owner goes, how can you cost that much? I'm just bidding what I see on the plans. So right. that adversarial relationship starts, I think, primarily because of the disconnect of building cost to what's being designed. And you just you get tired of being the bearer of the bad news. So um, I think that is completely squashed when you are invited to the table. So you find those architects that you want to work with who welcome your input and desire to see the home go 3D. So you would say the key is if you're at the table, they don't over-design because you're able to control that design to the budget as it goes, as opposed to at the end going, you know, you're at 400 square foot, you want to spend 300 square foot. You know, absolutely, Paul. It's, it's no different than an interior designer. There's two different kinds you can hire. The one where they're going to put their stamp and you just have to live in the home, or they're going to cater to you. There are some interior designers that I'm going to recommend that you're going to live in that home that they design. They're going to pick everything, the color scheme, the style, and everything, and, and it's going to look like a model home. And uh, No, 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 don't move the pillows. No, I, I, no, I, I, no, no, those accessories are important right there. You can't even live in your right. home. It's, it's no different. If you go to an architect who's designing this, this perfect monument for you, then you went for that reason. If you want input, just like if you want input with the interior designer, get someone who's accommodating for you. Just choose the right one. The architects aren't evil. You just have to choose the one that is either designing their next masterpiece or your next home. Right. So, Michael, I have a question. If you could talk to our you know, audience here and give them a couple pieces of advice saying, well, after doing this, you know, 20 years, I've learned a couple of things that I think are really important to convey to the audience. What would those be? Well, um, and I don't think this only pertains to high-end custom homes. I now back up my career and I look at all the different steps I took through semi-custom, custom, even track homes. Number one, you have to understand that all buyers are different. They all come from a different point of view. Some are very, very anxious. Uh, they've never done this before. Uh, and they need a lot of, of, of warm fuzzies. You have to hold their hand. Others, they're using you as the necessary uh, builder. Because they'd rather do it themselves, and they're going to be overly involved. There's some that want to know all the details. There are others, they just want to know how's everything coming. So know your client. Understand their personality. Understand how to communicate to them. They all want to be communicated, but in different ways. So... When you, when you find that someone's going to be difficult, it's generally because they're trying to knock on your door. They, they perceive that you are not there for them. You're there to build a home, get to get in and get out. When you reach out to them and let them feel like they're co-building with you, you've got to give them a little bit of rope if you don't want them pulling on the other side of the rope in your direction and, and strangling you. We always tell people that it's, it's an honor to partner with you to build your home. I'm the contractor. I've got the subs, but I tell them that I enjoy partnering with them. If they are given whatever say they want, whether it's a lot or a little, let them talk. 
you'll know what's important to them and you'll be able to address that directly. It's, it's adversarial if you don't know where they're coming from and you feel that it's in it just for the contract business, you're only there to deliver a product. I'm sorry, but I'm there to deliver a custom building experience. And if they enjoy the experience, I did my job. Look, I can get all the subs I want to build a beautiful home and put my name on it. I want to give the client a memorable experience that they're going to say, you need to call Michael at Aurora Builders. We had a wonderful time with Julie, with Jeff, with John, the superintendent, no matter who it is, top to bottom. It was a great experience. So bottom line, it's about the experience as much or not more than the product. In custom home building, it is all about the experience. Most of our, most of the, my, my competition, we use the same subcontractors. It's about the experience and making it memorable and giving them a reason to sell your next home for you. Right. Good advice. You know, Michael, we always talk about collaborative construction and how important that is and to emphasize the process and not just the product. And um, I think your, your, your visit here today has, has emphasized that in spades. You, you've just got some really great wisdom there from your 42 years of doing this. I can tell you're very diplomatic in the way that you deal not only with the architects, but also with your clients. And uh, I can see why you have been so successful at Aurora Builders. Absolutely. Thank you. It's a, it's a never-ending learning process, but you need to give if you expect to receive. And uh, to me, I am stronger if I have alliances with the trade partners and not working against them. So uh, right. whether it's an architect or a trim carpenter, uh, when they feel that you acknowledge their contribution and, 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 and uplift them, they want to work with you. And there is no adversity. There's no pulling in two different directions. Great. Good advice. That's great. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, uh, we really appreciate all of your, your wisdom and, and approaches are just really consistent with, with the advice that we often give to our coaching clients. So thank you again for, for joining us. And uh, for all of our listeners, uh, stay tuned and join us again for another episode of Contractor Success Tips. We'll see you then. Thanks so much. Thank you.